Welcome to an episode of the Jasmine Star Show. I have to tell you that generally a hard and fast rule on this podcast is I have conversations with people I know on a personal level, and I decided to bend the rules a little bit only because we're separated by one person who is the biggest fan of today's guest. So my good friend, she's been on this podcast before, Amy Porterfield. Well, <laughs> we spill the tea. We spill the tea often. And Amy is, has been talking about this woman for such a long time that when I had the opportunity to have her on the podcast, it was, it was a yes. But when Megan dropped a book, which here's the thing, y'all, here's the thing. I have been talking and loving mindset for so long. So just imagine this title kind of popples by mind your mindset, the science that shows success starts with your thinking. Okay. That alone. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sold. I'm like hook, line and sinker. I'm getting this book. And then lo and behold, Amy Porterfield tells me that it is uh, written by somebody we have on the podcast today. Y'all, I just want to give a very warm welcome to Megan Hyatt Miller. Megan, I'm so happy you're here today. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. That was like the best intro of all time. <laughs> well, we have to give, we have to give, we have to give it, we have to give credit to where credit is due. Amy has just said the most glorious things oh. about you. A big fan of your work, you know, first and foremost. And then having this opportunity here yeah. today, we're gonna get super granular. And people know that I really kind of stay away from like the the book podcast tours, love them. But what I really want to have is a conversation. And the conversation yeah. happens to be centered around a book. And so all of this is true, it's authentic, it is integrity to what it is that I, I do. So Megan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having this conversation more than anything. We like to have practical tips, takeaways. We want to get people to taking action. And oftentimes the thing that I know is that action is always desirable, but then we let sometimes things get in the way of that. So yeah, as we start, I'm kind of like a no nonsense. We just dive right in. You know? I love this. So, I okay, love great. It. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so I want to go back and we're going to get to origin story and all that good stuff, but I want to get somebody right now. Like we want to take the mask off. We have a real conversation of yeah. asking if there was a specific moment in your own story that you realized you were just not going to hit your goals without changing your mindset. When did yeah. this journey start for you? Well, this is kind of a vulnerable story to tell, but I feel like this is the right place to tell it. Yes. Uh, I love it. <laughs> uh, I had a debilitating fear of public speaking. And some of you guys listening can relate to this. Maybe nobody knows about it, which is true for me. Nobody, but my husband knew about this. It began when I was in high school. I watched a good friend deliver a presentation in front of the class. And she had an anxiety attack mid presentation ran out found her sobbing in the bathroom on the floor and my brain did what brains do. And it saw the situation and, and subtly developed a story that said, speaking is dangerous. It can lead to total humiliation, to losing control of your body and you should avoid it at all costs. And so I didn't know this was happening. I mean, this is like happening in my subconscious and I go on throughout my life and I'm in my twenties, you know, at this point, and I'm saying no to professional opportunities that might involve having to be in front of people, even things, small things like being in front of a board and, and delivering a presentation to a board. Like I didn't want to do that. So I passed up that opportunity or I thought about writing a book at one point and I decided not to do that because I knew I'd have to do things like this, you know, be on a podcasts or, or do speaking events. And so fast forward in the, in the company that now, um, I lead as CEO with my dad, Michael Hyatt, we it's called full focus number of years ago, I was about to, uh, or I was, I was in the CEO role at that time. And my team came to me and said, Hey, you know, it's the funniest thing we have just noticed. We've never had you keynote before. And we have this great idea for a live event. There's going to be 800 people. It'll be fabulous. We want you to keynote. And in my heart, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my worst nightmare. I'm going to be exposed. I'm going to be humiliated. Uh, none of my team knew that I had this fear. My dad didn't know that I had this. Nobody knew other than my husband. And I reluctantly said yes and went on a six week journey of looking this fear in the face. And Jasmine, what I knew was I didn't want to live in a small story anymore. I didn't, I, I knew that I was being limited. You know, I was beyond 
in many ways professionally this fear, but it felt so true and it felt so threatening. And so I went on a, a journey of retelling that story so that I would ultimately have access to different actions like hiring a speaking coach, an anxiety coach, a uh, life coach. I mean, I, I did it all. I got medicine for my doctor. I did all the things so that I could at, at the end tell a better story that would enable me to stand up in front of those 800 people. And despite the panic I had, the uh, panic attack I had the day before the event, I got up on that stage and I wasn't nervous. It was truly fun and it changed my life. And so that's really kind of the genesis of this book from my perspective and my story with regard to mindset. It's all about changing your story. Mm. So uh, there's a couple of things that came up for me. And so um, if you're listening audio, this is perfect. If you happen to be watching the video, you'll see me looking down a lot. I, I told Megan, like, I didn't want it to be appear rude, but as a podcast host, I actually take notes, taking notes is how that. I learn. And so Megan's talking and people are like, Justin's being so rude. No, no, no. I got my notebook. And one <laughs> of the things that I really loved is like, I didn't want to live a small story yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a powerful form of ownership. Because yeah. we say, oh, that's not me, or this is me, or could you not just say that's a small story and I choose mm -hmm. to embrace it or not? And so yeah. I kind of just want to start there and talk about how on the outside, people see here's a COO and now you're a CEO of this amazing, big, thriving company. They would never know that yep. you were choosing a small story and how many yeah. of us are volitionally choosing a small story. Mm -hmm. And so when you said, um, you know, that's when I, I wrote a new story. And so I want to get practical. I want to lay yeah. out the getting started <laughs> with mindset. And so for me, I have been on a big journey here on the podcast. We talk mm -hmm. about mindset and I think it's kind of like this nebulous idea and yeah. I'm working through it and I'm studying it and I'm absolutely geeking out. Now there are people who are just getting started in business. And we're going to kind of talk about different types of business owners on this journey. Yeah. But if you're advanced, if you are making tens of millions, or you're just getting started with your first 10,000, like there's people who are starting a business and they haven't yet made sales and they're unsure, like, am, am I good enough? Is this going to work? I see this a lot, regardless of the size of the business. So yeah. if a person were to come to you and say, Megan, what's my first step? Like, how do I start focusing on mindset? It seems like this. Yeah. Big thing. What do you say? Where do we start? Well, I love that you pointed that out, Jasmine, because I think you're right. It does feel like this big squishy thing. That's like some people just maybe magically get, and maybe yes. you feel like there are people that don't get it. The good news is that's actually not true, despite how it might feel. So what's happening for all of us is that our brain takes the facts of our lives, you know, maybe the fact that you haven't made a sale yet, or the fact that you, you've done 10,000, or the fact that you've done 10 million, what, whatever that number is for you. And then it tells us a story about what that means, because our brain likes to make meaning. It likes uh, to, to give us interpretations that ultimately are going to keep us safe and protected. And so uh, that's where really the self-doubt comes from, because our brain doesn't want us to try new things. It doesn't like it when we're out of our comfort zone and all of that. So really the first step in starting to think about mindset is to realize that you have this character that we call the narrator in your head, really just your brain, but we personify it who is interpreting the events of your life all the time and telling you what they mean. And it does that in the form of a story. Like I always, I could never, this is how this works. This usually comes out as statements about how the world works, how you are, or how other people are. So those are kind of the three categories that generally these statements, these stories present themselves in. And so the first step is really just identifying the story that you're telling around something where you feel stuck or where you want to go to the next level, but maybe that feels out of reach for you. And if you can just begin to be aware of the story, then you're really set up for the next step, which is to interrogate the story. And at this point, we want to kind of shake loose what happens in our lives or what the facts are from the story that our narrator is telling us about those facts. Because once you start to loosen those things up and you realize they're actually two different things, there's facts and then there's the fiction or the story we put on top of it, then you're set up for step number three, which is to imagine a better story. What I see people do with mindset sometimes is they try to leapfrog from identifying a story that they're telling that they know is really contributing to them playing small. And they try to leapfrog to a bigger, better story without interrogating it. And it just doesn't stick because it's kind of like your brain says, yeah, right. You know, because you're, you're still, it feels so true that story and the facts together, you know? And so you've really got to go through the interrogation process. So you set the stage for the new story taking root. Okay. So can we pause there for a second? Yes. Um, okay. So 
I'm CEO of Social Curator and I work with small business owners. And I decided at the start of 2023 to go through a four week mindset program. Now this is not a promotion because it's closed. Yeah. So I'm in the middle. And at the time of this recording, this morning, I taught session number two of four. And what has been really fascinating is that it's interactive. I'm teaching it live. It's a cohort and people are writing in the chat. And to me, this is like the most phenomenal R and D to understand yeah. the journey of a small business owner and then distilling it and being like, what could I create to get people mm -hmm. past this point? Now, the thing that I have noticed, and I'm going to present this because in case people on the podcast are listening, it's, it's a, you had said, identify the story, interrogate the story, apply a new story. That sounds amazing, but people get stuck on applying like on assessing the story. You yeah. can go back to a, uh, like immediately, oh, anxiety yes. ridden as a result of public speaking, you knew the story so you can interrogate it. People have a hard time identifying what happened to make me feel or second guess or pause or stay stuck today. How do you, how do they find that story? Yeah. Well, first of all, try to think about what, what are the sentences kind of just in my head? Cause stories really present themselves like statements. So what am I saying? And then start to ask yourself the question. This is part of the interrogation. Would somebody else with a different set of experiences, would they interpret that set of facts, the girl in the bathroom crying after having anxiety from this, the event at the school, would they have come to the same conclusion that speaking was dangerous? that speaking would lead to humiliation? Or might they have come to another conclusion like she needs some more practice or maybe she's really introverted or who knows? I mean, you could come up with like a whole list of things. I, by the way, am quite introverted myself. So that's not to say that you can't speak if you're introverted. Um, but you, know, you want to try to just, it's almost like you're trying to peel your fingers back from the grip on that story that makes it feel so true by asking, would somebody else see it that way? What else could be true? Can we really verify that story as being a fact or is that a subjective interpretation of those facts? And I did this actually with a group the other day and they were struggling with um, a new system that was being rolled out in their business. And they, they really weren't excited about it. They didn't think the team that was going to be doing it was the ideal team. They wanted to be able to do it themselves. They thought they had more expertise. And the interesting thing is that when you have a story that feels like facts, but it's not, it directs the actions that you take, which ultimately deliver the results that you're getting in your life. And so, for example, if you think a team who is working on something in your company is incompetent or they're not as good as you would be at doing it, how you show up to try to implement what they're going to suggest is going to be very different than if you think they're great at what they're doing or they're really smart. And that's ultimately going to affect the success of that project. And that's true in so many areas of our life, which is why this is so powerful. Mm. So can we get a little bit more granular? Yeah. Okay. So uh, top two limiting beliefs or the stories that people are repeating yes. as fact yep. I, that I've seen is I don't know how, Yes. like, I don't know the first step. I don't know right. how, and I don't have time. Yes. So we all have different stories mm -hmm. that led us to this belief, but could you give us an example of how I don't have time? Like what story could have produced yeah. that for us to have that as our narrative as an example? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, for example, like I'm a mom of five kids. I have five children, ages 21 to three, and I have a business. And I had to make a really big decision when my middle boys, they're adopted from Uganda. When they came home, they had a lot of traumatic experiences and needed a lot of hands-on, you know, parenting to help them heal. And as I was kind of ascending in my career, I made the decision that I was going to be done every day at three o'clock because I needed to be present for them. And so instead of thinking to myself, I don't have time to do everything I need to make this business succeed, which by the way, is the first thought I have. Your brain's always going to give you kind of these self-protective negative thoughts. So don't worry about that. You're not doing anything wrong. If that happens, you're just, congratulations, you're normal. Um, <laughs> I, I said to myself, wait a second, is that really true? Is it really true that I can't get everything done that I need to get done to make this business grow? No, I, I mean, I, I couldn't, there's not like a list of here's all the things you have to do exactly other than the list I'm making for myself. In fact, what if I have exactly enough time to get the most important things done and I can ultimately build a team to do the things that I don't have time to do? Well, that all of a sudden radically changes how I approach that situation. And I was doing that, by the way, 
at a time when our team was very small. My kids are much older now um, when I had a lot fewer resources than I had today, but I chose to embrace the constraints. And so, for example, you might say, um, I don't have enough time to do everything, but I do have enough time to do the most important things. And so that's what we call a paradoxical framing of a story where you don't totally discount your original story because there probably is a grain of truth in it. And I think it's not helpful to kind of completely dismiss it in some cases, but you can, you can twist it. You know, I, my time is limited, but I have all the time I need to do the most important things. And I think that changes how you're thinking about the actions you're going to take, because now you're going to become like I did way choosier about the decisions that you're making, what you choose to invest your time in, you're mm-hmm. not going to be jumping on mm-hmm. Facebook or Instagram unless it's in mid workday, unless it's for professional purposes. You know, you're going to be like really focused and very choosy about what you invest in. And that's going to change your results. Oh, so good. Thank you for diving deep there and adding yeah. clarity. So a person who's here and they hear, well, CEO, five kids, having time for the most important, assembling teams. And that was on the origins of mindset. And then there's always the skeptic, which I appreciate. And I applaud. I am not. Yes, the skeptic. Me too. And many people are like, well, I don't see how this mind stuff, like stuff, it kind of like works for me. Like whenever I have a problem, I just go and solve it. I take action, yeah. I figure it out. Yes, I don't yes. really need to focus because adding mindset just makes it more uh, like another layer. Okay. So would you say that mindset work is for everybody? Or do you think yes. there's more people who are like more akin to it? Where do you go? I think there are probably people who are more naturally open to it, but I wouldn't say there's any, there's not any research that would suggest that some people are going to get better results with mindset or, you know, they're just like naturally hardwired to, to really benefit from mindset work while others won't. I, here's what I would say to that person, because I totally relate to you. And my husband, who is our chief product officer and was very instrumental in the research of this book would naturally be on in that camp and has really made a lot of progress over time as he's delved into the research on this, because here's the thing, your brain is if you're action biased, which I mean, I can tell Jasmine, you are, I am, it's like, let's go get it done. Right. But when you have an action bias, the actions that you're taking are limited by the story that you're telling. So a story that says I could never, or this is not possible. There's no way I could go from $10,000 that I made last year to a hundred thousand dollars this year. There's just no way that could happen. Well, your brain is going to do that thing where it starts sorting for solutions that are congruent with your story. It's kind of like if you bought a Tesla, all of a sudden you would think everybody in your town bought a Tesla. In fact, you just started noticing them because you're, you've got one yourself. Same thing with our actions and the solutions that we have access to. So if you want to have access to the kind of actions that are going to get you the results you want, then you have to go further upstream and you have to tell a story that's going to kind of point your brain in the direction of the solutions that are going to be helpful instead of getting you more of what you're already getting. So that's why this matters. You just can't think the thoughts you need to think to get where you want to go unless your brain is predisposed to look for the solutions you need. So how might somebody do that? Like, can you give us like a a super granular example? Like when you have to go upstream, like I get this, but there might be somebody who's listening to be like, what does that actually mean? Okay. So for example, I, um, I have been a person who's really prioritized my health for a long period of time. I had a rare heart attack. There's nothing to do with lifestyle. It has some some kind of freaky heart attack that almost nobody ever has for young active women in their forties. That's who gets this heart attack. It's called a scad heart attack. So I had this about a year and a half ago. And my doctor said, you also have some genetic risk for other heart disease. I think that you should really try to focus, uh, you know, at an even higher level on reducing your risk by losing weight. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm not real excited about that. Um, But I I had some early success with some lifestyle stuff. And then I hit a wall and I just wasn't making progress. And so, you know, my natural instinct would be, I need to be more consistent. Maybe I need to add 15 more minutes of walking every day. Maybe, you know, whatever, just those little tweaks. In reality, that wasn't going to get me where I needed to go. And so I 
because I said, I don't know how to get a breakthrough here, but I'm certain there's a, there is a solution. I just have to find it. Okay. So that's my story. I don't know how to get a breakthrough here, but I'm sure there's a solution uh, if, if I can just find it. Well, I ended up finding an amazing regenerative medicine doctor out in California who does a lot of work with peptides. And there's been a lot in the news about some new peptides that have come out that have been helpful. And I've lost 50 pounds in the last uh, about eight months and dramatically lowered my heart disease risk in the future. And the reason I was able to get different results is because I took different actions. But the only way I had uh, had access to different actions is because I had a story that set my brain up to go find that solution. Because our brain's going to go answer the question that we give it. And if we give it you know, unproductive or unhelpful questions, it'll find those answers, but they're not going to help you. And in my case, this was a big breakthrough. Okay, girl, it's like you just take the, the high level stuff and I'm like, I get it, I get it. And then you add a practical real life example <laughs> and I'm like, poof. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, part of the reason why I was really excited for this conversation and I'm going to say an interview because I, I truly think that I'm just, we're connecting and you speak my love language, that is mindset, but then you speak <laughs> my second love language, which is productivity. Yes. And like, I think there's this like beautiful, distinct intersection between the two. And I think we yeah. can think of one or we think of the other, but when did you first start to realize that the two of them could and are actually are yeah. intersected? I think it, it was really when I faced this crossroads of my careers taking off. I want to be able to do big things in my business but the needs of my family are increasing. And so am I going to compromise my career so that I can really be present for my family? Or am I going to compromise the needs of my kids so that I can go chase this professional dream? And I, I got to the place of saying like, that stinks. I don't like either one of those choices. You know, what I want is both. And so when I started thinking about not just how do I get it all done? Because we all know, like, there literally is not enough time to get it all done. Like there are always going to be more things to do than we could ever have time for. I don't care how much time you have. And we all have the same amount of time, really. Um, I, instead, I said, okay, I don't have time for everything, but I do have time to get the right things done. And so how can I go further upstream when I think about my productivity to thinking about what's my highest leverage contribution? What are the things that only I can do in my business? And if I focus on those things that, are, that I'm most passionate about and that deliver the biggest results in my business, we have a whole model for this. We call the freedom compass. And that little sweet spot of passion and proficiencies, we call it, is the desire zone. If I focus on my desire zone, then that's going to mean that I'm way more efficient. I need to, I can spend proportionally fewer hours to get way bigger results. And that's the magic. I mean, the only way we can, uh, you know, have what we want in terms of personal margin is we have to achieve more, but do less. And the only way to do that is to get clearer and clearer on your own contribution. And that's really a mindset thing more than anything else. I mean, it's not, it's not tactical, you know? Oh, this is so interesting. Okay. So when you talk about mindset, when you talk about productivity, when you talk about this idea of being done with work at 3 PM and mm -hmm. you wanted the, the both and, yeah. And I'm like, yes, there's so many people who are like, I, I too want that. And yes. then I, I, I go through and I add the layer of, you had mentioned earlier that your husband was head of product and I didn't yeah. know that. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So then my mind started to like flittering around with, you are the CEO, your yep. father uh, had started the company and then there was yep. a transition and your husband. So it's very, like a, it's a family affair. Yep. And then I started thinking, well, what, how then does this look like in layered productivity? Does your husband leave work at 3 PM with you mm -hmm. or what, what does that look like? And yeah. how have you guys both applied the mindset? You said he did a lot of the research, which I'm, I'm loving for this. I wish I, was I, in, I wish I was at your kitchen table for dinner. Like I want to hear about how all this happened. What is that intersection now? What does it look like for you? Yeah. People are hearing CEO. What is that life mindset yeah. productivity actually look like? Yeah. Our, you know, our kids are like, mom and dad, can you please stop talking about the brain? You know, their eyes are glazing over their teenagers for the most part. So this, is, <laughs> this is not their idea of great dinner time conversation, but that's okay. Hopefully it'll pay off at some point. It will. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So Joel uh, does leave work pretty much every day at three o'clock. Uh, we, one of the cool things about working together, both being executives and all that, which, you know, like I grew up with parents with a, who are wonderful, but had a very traditional arrangement in their marriage. 
my dad worked, my mom stayed home. I didn't know any other women that worked. Like this is a new thing for in our marriage that I had really no template for. And so it's required a new mindset of around really partnership. What does it look like to partner with your spouse around work and around caring for these five children and our home and all of those things. And it's been a process, you know, where um, we we keep getting better at it. We've been married now for 14 years. So the older, if you're doing the math, the older two kids are from his first marriage. So that's why they're older than the length of our marriage. Um, but it's been so cool to be on this journey together and to be open to shifting our thinking, because I think I started out years ago, like I have to do it all. You know, I'm the CEO at work and I'm the CEO at home. And the problem is that doesn't work. Like it's too much. And I had to be honest with him and say, I don't just need your help. I need your partnership. And fortunately I'm married to an amazing guy and he stepped up. And even just in the last month, we're iterating on this again, and it's becoming even more equitable but that starts with how we're thinking about it together, not just what we're doing. Because the doing part becomes easy when the thinking part is aligned. Mm. When the thinking part, the doing becomes easy when the thinking is aligned. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the stories that we tell ourselves and how, what you just described between not just help, but partnership. Mm -hmm. People look at this and maybe not in a personal relationship, but yeah. they apply to story. And your story had then uh, become like the two of you guys are going to actively think similarly, going to have conversations around that. But there's other people yeah. who are saying, I have a story and I can't tell myself a different story. I can't go upstream because the story is true. Yes. Like, this story is true. What happens to the person or how do you speak to the person of this story is true? No matter what mindset work I do, this is true. How do we, yeah. how do we break that? Yeah. Well, first of all, of course it feels true. And let me just say, if that story has an origin in a painful experience, and certainly if it has an origin in a traumatic experience, it is going to be more challenging to dislodge. And I speak about this as someone who's had a lot of experience walking through with my kids healing from traumatic experiences. All three of my younger kids are adopted. Um, and a lot of the work that their therapist does is narrative work about, as she says, getting the right feelings on the right people and the right events, because our memory and the stories we tell sometimes um, are, they, they feel true, but they're not true and they're hurting us, you know, or they're hurting people we love. And so that's why to look at it. But first of all, recognize that it's okay that it feels true and then begin to ask yourself, like I did this exercise the other day with a couple of clients and on the left-hand side of the whiteboard, we wrote down, what are the facts? Okay. So you're just writing the facts. And this is like, things that would be on a police report things that would be on a medical report. I mean, it's not emotionally charged usually for the most part. It's kind of boring. Um, this is not commentary at all. You know, it's like if you're watching a football game, there's what happens on the field. And then like the, the time on the clock, who has the ball, you know, did they get a touchdown or not? And then there's the guys that are commentating on the game. And that's the story part. It's not factually true or false. They're saying, what does it mean? What does it mean that Patrick Mahomes had an injury to his ankle? Will he be able to play in the Super Bowl? You know, that kind of thing. And so if you on the one side, put the facts and then on the other side, you write down what you think about those facts, the stories, getting it out of your head and objectifying it enables you to go, oh, these are two separate things. Even if I still believe the stories, I can see that these are two separate things. Then you go to that interrogate phase and you start to say, what else could be true here? What If I were to just ask somebody on the street and read them the facts on the left-hand side, would they come up with the same stories or what else might they come up with? And that is part of the process of loosening the connection between the facts and the story. And Jasmine, sometimes we need somebody else to come into this process with us. That might be your best friend or your spouse. That might be, uh, you know, a pastor or a mentor. That might be a coach. That might be a therapist. And don't be afraid of that because sometimes when, when you really feel stuck in a story, somebody else can give you access to thinking that you couldn't get on your own. And that's one of the biggest hacks of this mindset stuff is to pull in outside resources when you need them. Yeah, oh, so good. So I'm just I like just yes and amen to all of this. So we have the way um I just love the the explanation with the whiteboard. The yeah. Facts. 
and then the feelings towards the facts and then yep. asking ourselves if we could apply a different feeling towards the same set of facts with right. another person apply the same feelings on those facts. Yeah. And the same interpretation, you know? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so when we talk, we go back to somebody's feeling like I can do this. I'm going to feel good now here on the podcast, big proponents of mindset and productivity. And so we talk about being consistent, working smarter yeah. and not harder. Yeah. And so people are feeling, I'm ready to tell myself a new story. I'm ready to do this and I'm ready to be consistent and I'm ready to have the mindset for it. And then all of a sudden when that happens, it feels like there's like this challenge, the challenge yeah. is, oh, your kids got unexpectedly sick or your partner loses their job or think something yep. unexpected happens. It's at that point, like, can you talk like how we can like quickly reroute our mindset yeah. after we've got to this point, we're feeling on a high, then we get hit down and we're like, how many times do I have to get hit? How do we sharpen that mindset to like, how yeah. do we get the boomerang faster? Well, first of all, what you said reroute is literally what's happening in your brain. These stories, especially the ones that feel really, really true and kind of have a hold of you, they are literally neural pathways in our brain that think of it as the difference between a dirt road and like an interstate. And, you're, and who wouldn't rather drive on the interstate than the dirt road, right? It's just the default place that our brain wants to go. And so what we want to do is we want to train our brain to not stop thinking negative things or the disempowering stories, because those are just always going to come up. But when we think those things to realize, oh, wait a second, I have a choice in the story that I'm going to connect to on this, just because my brain says, oh, my kids got COVID and I had to cancel three client meetings and I'm not going to get those uh, contracts because of that. That doesn't have to mean, and I'll never build the business I want to build. That could just mean, oh, you know what? That gives me more time to refine my branding, to refine my value proposition, to get clear on my pitch. And that's actually going to make me stronger once I'm on the other side of this period of, you know, the kids being out of school and juggling all the COVID stuff. And I think it, it's really in that choice of I can either believe the default story or I can be intentional about training my narrator. Like think of it like a puppy, you know, you can train your puppy or you can just let them run wild. And if you train your narrator to begin thinking of stories that are helpful, that lead you to that kind of actions that will ultimately lead you to the kind of results you want, that's where the magic is because we don't have to be passive bystanders or even victims of these stories that are controlling our lives. We can tell something different. Oh, so good. Now um, we're going to be tying up right now, but I do have one other question. Um, yes. As people apply this mindset work to their home life. Yeah. And maybe they don't have, maybe they question if their partner is um, as willing to explore and change the mindset, but specifically even in the workplace. Like sometimes I think to myself, like I'm deep diving and I, I kind of feel like when somebody says, oh, you're not how you used to be. I'm, I say, thank you. Right. Thank Yay. you so much. Like, <laughs> it's a, so as a leader on a team, do we, how, what, what can, what can we expect? Does it have to be yeah. self-driven? Can we inspire our partners or coworkers to change their mindset? Yeah. Like, what is your philosophy on that? Well, I think always our first job is ourself. And I think when we do our own work, that often changes other things. And I think we got to be careful that we don't just sort of assume that we're going to be everybody's coach unless we have their permission. You know, I think asking someone, hey, can I just share something that I heard you say that I'm not sure that you're aware of and explaining this to them. This would be, by the way, if you if you have an open partner or spouse and you want to do like a little book club with Mind Your Mindset, this would be a great date night for a few weeks. You know, my husband, Joel, <laughs> I like to read books together. So I think that can be fun. Um, but, but focus on yourself first, because this is a gift to people around you at whether you're a leader, a spouse, a friend, a parent, I have all kinds of examples of using this with my kids, but if I hadn't done my own work first, I wouldn't have been able to do this. So that would be my recommendation is focus on yourself first and, uh. and really develop the self-awareness. And then you can go on out from there. Okay. So big fan that when I first started business and I, there was a difference of having a business online and then having an online business and yes. when you have an online business, I heard the terms swipe copy, which basically yeah. somebody's just giving you the right words to say, basically like a script. And yes. so I'm going to play a game with you as we close. Cause I keep on saying as okay. we close, but I can keep you on for like hours. Um, let's play a game, uh, swipe copy or things to say as a parent, after you've done the work, like you feel yes. like you're in a much better place to guide yeah. your children to their awareness of how they're speaking or the narr of the narration yeah. and how I might instill this or have a conversation with my team. If I see a pattern yeah. or the way that somebody's thinking, can I get both? 
Yes. Okay. So parenting, uh, recently, uh, my son, Jonah, who is 12 is learning to play golf. If you've ever played golf, it's hard. A lot, it's a lot of pieces and parts to put together. And he took this clinic for a while where he was learning all these discrete skills. And then it was time to actually go out on the course that did not go so well for him. So he said, mom, I'm terrible at golf. Every time I want to, you know, go to hit the ball, it goes in the opposite direction. Like I, I'm just not good at golf. I think I want to quit. And I said, but what if you're just learning? What if this is a complicated game and you're just learning? And of course, you're not going to get it right at the beginning. This is part of the process. This is how you become great. And I think, honestly, that's really good um, feedback or good reframing of a story for a kid. But it's also good for us because as adults, we forget that we're just learning. We don't have to be perfect at it the first time. And if you think about the actions you take, when you're just learning, as opposed to, I have to be perfect at this, you're going to continue, right? You're going to keep trying. If you're just learning, if mistakes are okay, and that's going to ultimately make you great versus giving up. And so that's my parenting one. Um, I think with your team to just ask the question, is that a fact or is that an interpretation? And then is that going to lead to the results that you want when you think about what actions that will require you to take or, or put kind of front of mind? or not. And I think my team has gotten really good at this where they go, Ooh, yeah, that, that story is probably not helpful. This might just be a story they'll say sometimes. And even just saying this might be a story, like, let's say somebody's talking to you about a a issue with a coworker that they're having and they're, and they were uncomfortable with the way a meeting went. If you just can say, this might be a story. It opens up the opportunity that there might be another interpretation that's more generous, that's more helpful, it's more productive. And I think as a leader, that's part of what we want. We want that flexible thinking in our team because that's when they can access novel solutions. I love that. I love that. In fact, I actually didn't realize that I was applying it the same way, but maybe taking it uh, in a slightly different direction. Um, If I say had a conversation with somebody or had a check-in one-on-one and I felt like something was amiss, yeah. What I say, and I go back and I'm like the story I'm telling myself yes. on the back of this conversation, this has resulted. Am I off here? So when I say the story, yes. I'm telling myself, it gives me the opportunity to be like, that's a hundred percent a story. Yes. Uh, so, uh, think I you. love that. That's a, that's a huge breakthrough. I think that's, um, from Brene Brown. I remember her talking about that and man, if you get that as your swipe copy, you will, <laughs> you will disarm people left and right. And you'll make sure you have a productive and helpful story in your relationships. It'll be so helpful. Don't we all wish we just had a little Brene on our shoulder? Like I would, I, I, I can make billions. I can make yeah. billions selling right. a little just Brene right on your there. shoulder. <laughs> 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 Megan, thank you a thousand times mm-hmm. over for those who are listening and you want more information. You can find her book and all the amazing stuff she does at every book retailer. We have a lot going on and yes. also at fullfocus.co. Is there anywhere else you'd want to send people Yes. To, in addition to mind your mindset, anything else? Yes. Thank you for asking that because we actually have some special bonuses for your listeners. We have a special course. We have the audio book and we also have a self-coacher tool, which is a great like Mad Lib style paint by numbers tool to do this process on yourself. Um, so all you do is go buy the book, wherever you like to buy your books, Amazon or your local retailer, or whatever, take the receipt to mindyourmindsetbook.com slash Jasmine. And that's where you can get those three bonuses. So don't miss out on that because they're pretty cool. Oh, Megan, I had no idea that that was coming, but like, that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you yeah. so, so, so much. I Thank appreciate you. your time, your energy. Thank you for adding this to your schedule. In addition to being a mother, a partner, a wife, and a CEO, it just means so much. And I know that you're changing lives along the way. Thank you so much, Megan. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jasmine. This has been so fun.